While the Red Turban Rebellion may have failed to dethrone the Mongol invaders, it nevertheless succeeded in exposing the Great Yuan's weak spots. With everything south of the Yellow River in rebel hands, the Borjigan clan's claim to the Mandate of Heaven is weaker than ever before. To even the most disinterested, it appears that the empire which Kublai Khan had spent his life building may soon come crashing down. The Lord of Ten Thousand Years' Court is paralyzed by vicious political deadlock, and even as the seams begin to burst, Yuan still hobbles along its doomed path. From the fearsome daimyo in Japan to the rugged merchant monks of the Terran Basin, and even within the house of cards that is China, none can avert their gaze from the gathering storm. After all, whomever emerges the strongest has a chance to seize the most coveted prize of all, the Dragon Throne. To the west, just north of the Tarim Basin, lies the lands of the Karakatai. Ruled by descendants of the same Yalu dynasty that once governed northern China under the Great Liao, the Karakatai in 1444 stand poised to take advantage of the weakness of the Yuan and forge an empire of their own. It's finally here, the long-awaited Dragon's Throne update to Antebellum, my absolute favorite mod for EU4. Some of you guys may remember that back in the spring, I did a mod spotlight video on Antebellum, explaining most of the amazing lore and changes that this mod brings to the game. Later, I followed that up with a Let's Play, where we played the Kingdom of the Arl and got all the Electro slots in the HRE for ourselves. But we've been waiting for some time for the Dragon Throne update, and I'm excited to jump in. This update massively reworks the map of the East Asia, including 50 new provinces, new rivers, wastelands, a bunch of new tags, new content for both the Empire of China and a crazy rework of Japan, including a new Mongol sh shogunate and 10 new clans. There's mission trees for nearly every tag that's been included and other trees for existing tags all around this area of the map. Along with this, there's government reforms, formal nations, cultures, monuments, and even a new religion. Nestorian Christianity in Central Asia. That last part is what intrigued me the most. I wanted to jump in and play the game and then spin a narrative with it like I've done in some of my last videos. So that's what I did. I took the Karakatai and played for about a hundred years into the game in an attempt to reform the Great Liao and this video is that story. If you're interested in this mod, check out my Mod Spotlight video on it or head over to the mod's Discord I have linked in the description. Parmalion, the mod creator, has a Patreon if you want to support the mod and get it early like I did. But the update itself will be available on September 10th, this Friday. On that same day, I'm going to be putting up a sign-up sheet on my own Discord for an MP game set in this mod starting on September 18th and going every Saturday for probably about two months. Should be fun. Join the Discord if you want to be a part of it. Then next week, I'm going to be returning to the Denmark campaign and I already have my next achievement run planned for after that. I'm also going to be on Twitch today and over the next few days finishing up my Hamburg into the Buntuku achievement run. So head over there if you want to hang out for that. For now though, I'll shut up and jump into the story of the rise of the Karakatai and the restoration of the Great Liao. Yelu de Jong, the Resurrection. Their ruler, one Yelu de Jong, named after his ancestor who had brought the family from Liao Dong, was known to be a secretive and sometimes malevolent ruler but few doubted his abilities as a tactical genius in battle, and in April 1446, after securing alliances and making preparations, he launched his armies to the east and the south, attacking the Choros and Shul tribes, and thus what many historians termed the Liao resurgence had begun. De Jong's main goal in this war had been the return of the city of Kashgar, once under the control of his family, but taken by the Mongol overlords several decades before. Despite outnumbering his enemies, the two opposing tribes had focused their attention on invasion and attacking De Jong's ally, the Kusi tribe. De Jong was forced to siege the capital of Choros twice, after having thought that portion of the war was over, before the Choros continued to resist. For their impertinence, De Jong annexed the entirety of the lands of Choros, although he would set up a portion under a vassal state of Karadel, while from Shul he took only Kashgar and allowed the remaining lands to be governed as they were although now a vassal state of the Karakatai. This war exhausted the finances and the manpower of Karakatai, but De Jong knew that he couldn't let up if he one day wanted to see his nation powerful once again. His next target were his former allies of the Kusi, 
Having betrayed him during the previous war, he attacked the Kuchi in 1457, along with their allies of Ladakh. A relatively short war, following these engagements, the Ladakh were forced to bow down as a vassal state, and the lands of Kusi were annexed. In 1459, Dijong moved to secure both the remainder of the Tarim Basin, with an attack on the Koreana tribe, and to secure his northern border with an assault on the Torgut. The Torgut would fall and be annexed in February 1460, and the Tarim Basin fully secured in July, after the fall of the fort at Kwakilik. By the end of the year, Katai forces were pushing into the Amdo, eventually securing from them the Rabong area and their first portion of China proper, which De Zhang would eventually place under the control of a semi-autonomous Shun dynasty. Around that same time, he had ordered his western armies to assault the Guj, high in the Himalayas. His goal was to expand his southern buffer state of Ladakh, but in the process, he was also able to secure the vassalage of the state of Limbuan, whose borders he would later expand and would form as a gateway between China and India in future centuries. In 1469, De Jong's last conquest, that of the diminutive Dorbet tribe to the north, was concluded. He had pounced on them after their near destruction by the neighboring Koshud. After taking their lands, he found a relative of the former rulers and set him up as a puppet, with the intention of attacking the Koshud and restoring the vassal of Dorbet to their former lands. This would not come to pass under De Jong's reign, as distractions to the south would delay his attack, and in November 1469, at the age of 55, De Jong died suddenly from what is now believed to be a brain hemorrhage. His son, Jean II, assumed leadership. Later texts would posthumously assign the epithet The Resurrection to De Jong, as his conquest began what would result in the restoration of the great Liao less than a century later. Yelu Jian II, the Dragon Tamer. Jian took control of Karakatai at the age of 22. Having already proven himself an able commander, known to be an inspiring leader, he inherited a nation seemingly perpetually in crisis. To the south, their armies were bogged down against the Assamese, and to the north, there was a large-scale noble revolt. His father's conquests had increased the size and strength of not only the Karakatai, but of their problems. At the beginning of his reign, Jean accepted renewed vows of vassal loyalty from no less than six vassal states, but each, in their own way, were resisting the control of the Karakatai, and his efforts to manage disloyal vassals, while continuing to try to conquer and grow his realm, would define the first few decades of what would become a near 50-year reign. While De Jong had hoped the time was approaching that he could begin to refuse to pay tribute to the great Yuan, Jean was wise enough to know that he should continue to for some time. He focused on putting down rebels in the north, then cleaned up the war in the south, extracting reparations from Koch and Assam, only to be forced to return to putting down different rebels in the north. He then launched his father's planned attack on the Koshud in 1473, just before announcing the peace in the south. This would be a pattern that Jian would follow for the next two decades, launching a new war before piecing out the last, in an effort to keep his vassal states continuously at war and less likely to plot against them. The war with the Koshud would last until 1476, and Jian spent most of the time waiting for the siege of their capital city of Uliastai, and putting down even more rebels back home. And just before the peace was settled with the Koshud, a peace that would restore the Dorbet fully to their lands, he announced an attack on Delhi, a small rump state south in India. This war involved fighting Afghanistan, and lasted a bit longer than Jian had anticipated, until nearly the end of 1480. Monetary extractions from Kabul, Delhi, and later Guj would help to right the nation's finances, but unfortunately the Song, the dominant power in South China, had announced its intention to support the independence of Karadel, which set off a chain reaction that nearly led to the revolt of three of Karakatai's vassal states. Despite this, in 1483, the Ladakh were fully integrated into Karakatai, and Jian shifted his focus to dealing with the Song, attacking them outright in 1484. With the Song's allies, along with the general refusal by Jian's vassals to help in the war, the Kitchen armies were actually fairly substantially outnumbered by the Song. But the capture of the fortress of Xi'an, and later the sack of the Song capital of Chengdu, would allow the Kitchen forces to isolate and destroy a number of Song armies. And the peace that was signed in 1487 
would see the Shun given control of large swaths of their former territory and the crisis of vassal rebellions put to rest. Shortly after the war, the Karadale were forcefully integrated in the Karakatai, and Jian set his sights on finally fully integrating the Shul. A short conquest of the remaining Choshud lands from 1492 to 1493, and a small war to the south to keep the Tibetan states in line, helped to secure Xi'an's finances and realm stability. And in July 1497, after having refused to pay tribute to the Yuan in each of the last three years, Zhan launched the war against the Yuan that would gain him his title of the Dragon Tamer. It's little wonder that future European historians would gravitate to Zhan and his attacks on the Great Yuan that would later be known as the Clash of Dragons. Zhan propagandized his assaults on the Yuan not only as an attempt to assert what he saw as a legitimate rule of China by the Great Liao, but also as a crusade to spread Christianity to China, namely Nestorian Christianity. The Nestorian denomination of Christianity had been adopted by Xi'an's ancestors after being pushed west by Mongol forces up the Silk Road. While fairly unique, many scholars position Nestorianism as similar to many of the Orthodox sects. The Yelu dynasty long claimed that the strength of the Nestorian church gave them the cohesion to eventually restore Great Liao, with Xi'an himself often utilizing the icon of St. Anthony in churches he built and the paintings inside. This is believed to be the same St. Anthony of Egypt known to the Orthodox, Catholic, and Coptic churches as the father of monks. In any case, in December 1501, after a hard-fought four years, the first clash of dragons came to an end. John accepted the peace treaty with the Yuan, recognizing his nation's complete independence and peership with the great Yuan, and ceding control of three forts in central China, along with the former Mongolian capital of Kwarakorum in the north. Much of this land Jian would transfer to his vassal states of Shun, but the forts of Tongchuan and Ningxia on the border he would keep direct control, along with the city of Kwarakorum, which had been sacked and nearly destroyed by his armies in retribution for the now ancient conquest of Liao lands by the Mongols. The next decade was one of relative peace for the Karakitan. Kitchen armies only putting down rebellions in one small war to bring more of the Tibetan lands to heal. During this period, Jian proved himself something of an architectural visionary, funding the construction of many workshops, churches, and markets along the Silk Road, and funding the construction of roads, bridges, and many other infrastructure projects. Border disputes with the Song would erupt into conflict in 1512 and last for nearly two years, with only a relatively small change in the border despite the clashing of some of the largest armies since the Clash of Dragons. It is believed by many that Jian wished to see an end to war for his reign, preferring to set up his son for greater conquest as his father had once done for him. But in late 1518, Jian was forced, by rising tensions with the Great Yuan and his own nobles, to declare the second Clash of Dragons and attack the Yuan. Kitchen armies captured the Yuan fortress of Luan, then moved to attack the even larger forces at Hohat. Jian would not live to see the fall of Hohat, or the later capture of Beijing, as in May 1590, he was injured outside of battle and died from an infected wound. Yelu Kailuo, Jian's son and heir, had not yet reached eight years old. And so upon hearing of his death, the Council of Nobles was initially unsure how to handle the situation. This was put to rest almost immediately, as Yelu Sorgantani, Jian's first cousin, his second wife, and the mother of Yelu Kailuo, assumed control of a regency for her son. Yelu Sorgagtani, mother of the dragon. With the death of Xian, despite some initial momentum, the Kitchen armies soon faced setbacks. A small but significant force was routed and destroyed by the Yuan in the south, and despite their capital being captured, the Yuan repeatedly raised new armies in an attempt to recapture it, and to raid and harass into Kitchen hinterlands. Sorgagtani's command to use Beijing as a trap to continually destroy these newly raised Yuan armies proved largely successful, and in 1521, after having defeated no less than three major Yuan armies, she was able to secure a peace treaty with them. The major fort at Hohat, along with all the land between it and the Kitchen border, was transferred to Kitchen control and Yuan was now forced to accept Kitchen troops stationed closer to Beijing than ever before. Beyond the Second Dragon Clash, 
Sorgak Tani's reign as regent lasted an additional five years. Not much is written about her beyond that it was she who pressed the small vassal in northern India of Delhi to accept the Nestorian church, and that she refused to launch any conflicts during her term, preferring to allow her son to launch such attacks upon his ascension to the throne. But despite her short and quiet reign following the second dragon clash, Sorgagtani is remembered with reverence among Nestorians almost as strong as that for the Virgin Mary, possibly due to how much her own son, Kailuo, seemed to worship her in his youth and throughout his reign. If the man who re-established the Great Liao treated her this way, why should his loyal followers not do so as well? Yelu Kailuo, the Great Liao Reborn Yelu Kailuo came of age in early 1526. His first act was to attack Afghanistan, a nation whose border raids and political interference with vassals had annoyed Karakatai's rulers for large parts of both his father and grandfather's reign. This war would last until 1530, at which time Kailuo would force upon the Afghans a peace that saw him in control of Kabul directly, and never again would they be able to challenge his rule in this area. But truthfully, this war and other rebellions Kailuo put down during this period were just a sideshow. He believed his true destiny was to finally break the Yuan and restore Great Liao. And so, in July 1532, Kailuo commanded his armies to attack the Yuan in a war that would last right around three years, with his stated intention of, quote, recapturing the Mongolian lands. The peace treaty on July 31st, 1535, would do just that. The Karakatai now stood in control of the vast majority of Mongolia, and their borders stretched all the way to the edge of the Liaodong Peninsula under the control of the Temugids. It was Kailuo's desire to continue the conquest into his ancestral homeland, but his nation was exhausted, and he had many loans and rebels to deal with. Then, in 1538, a border conflict with the Song, reminiscent of those that had occurred during his father's reign, forced Kailuo to attack them with the might of two of his three armies. This war, along with the death of his young son Hechen, would distract Kailuo, who would take many months to return from the isolation of his grieving. It was mainly his generals who defeated the Song and their allies the Sang, integrating the Sang, forcing the Song out of Tibet and the Qishan vassal of Shu's land, and eventually absorbing the Liang Tang against the wishes of the Song as well. But in September 1541, Kailuo had returned, and he ordered an attack on Yuan that would become known as the Third Clash of Dragons. Persecuted from 1541 to 1545, this conflict would see the remaining portion of northern Mongolia transferred to the Karakatai, along with the lands of a vassal, the Liang, in central China, given up by the Yuan, and the armies and the emperor of Yuan humiliated as they were unable to resist the superior Kitchen armies at all. This gave Kailuo a renewed vigor, and after putting down rebellions in the south of Tibet, he turned to attack the Wangyan and secure the last of the lands of the Mongols, a small portion of which they held. This war turned out to be larger than he had anticipated, but his armies were able to prevail without much trouble, forcing each of their allies and eventually themselves to sign a peace treaty in late 1548. Officially uniting the Mongol lands, fully under Kitchen control. Two years later, after putting down a number of revolts and preparing his armies, Kaluo gave the order to invade the Temugids. Despite that nation being a fellow convert to the Nestorian branch of Christianity, nothing would prevent Kaluo from reclaiming his ancestors' homeland. The war would last until April 1554. The Temugids would receive nominal help from the Japanese but this proved inadequate, and they were forced to sign a peace that transferred the Liaodong Peninsula to Kailuo. And Yelu Kailuo became the first descendant of the Liao dynasty to taste the salt spray of his homeland in over 400 years. This would not be Kailuo's last triumph, however, as he immediately began preparations for the conquest of his ancestor's capital, Beijing. On July 31st, 1554, armies of Karakatai marched into the lands of the Yuan for the fourth time. The fourth clash of dragons. The final blow to any claim the Yuan still held to the Mandate of Heaven. The Yuan would resist until October 1556, 
when they were forced to sign a treaty that transferred the entire area of East Hevi to the Karakatai, renounce their title of Great Yuan, and accept the recognition of the resurrection of the Great Liao. And that is our story. Of course, there is much more after the rebirth of the Great Liao. Their conquest of South China, the classes with Japan, the unification of India and creation of their future greatest rival, and of course, their interactions with European explorers and later colonists that would set up most of the great clashes of more modern history. But those are stories that you will have to explore on your own if you wish. Remember to come over to the Discord if you want to join a multiplayer with me in this mod on the 18th. And head over to the Antebellum Discord and maybe the Patreon if you want to support this amazing mod. Thanks for watching to the end of the video, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.